بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد ايها الاخوه السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته so let's do a quick recap of what we took last week we spoke about the biography of ibn abdul uh, hajar rahimahu allah and then we got into the introduction of bab al-zuhd wal war and we went on to define what these terms mean and we went on to define what the objectives of this class are in the night time so in terms of defining zuhd and war who remembers what the definition was that we gave for them who remembers what the definition was that we gave for them i just need one of the definitions Excellent. So in terms of defining these terms, we said wara is to abandon anything that is harmful to one's akhirah. So anything that is harmful to your akhirah, you give it up. And zuhud is to abandon anything that is not beneficial to your akhirah. And based upon this definition, we said zuhud is of a higher level than wara. We said zuhud is a higher level than wara because to give up something that is not beneficial will automatically include something that is harmful. Will automatically include something that is harmful so we went on to say that this concept of understanding that which is beneficial and that which is harmful to your akhirah relies upon the simple concept of understanding the five rulings in islam everything that we do will revolve around those five rulings either something is farm or wajib or something is mustahab or something is mubah or something is makruh or something is haram For far as we said it is something obligatory if you do it you are rewarded if you abandon it you are sinful for mustahab we said this is something that which is recommended if you do it you are rewarded if you abandon it you are not sinful for mubah we said this is neither rewardable nor is it punishable for makruh we said if you were to do it you are not sinful but if you were to leave it intentionally then you are rewarded And then the last one which is haram if you were to do it you are sinful for it if you intentionally refrain from it then you are rewarded for this then you are rewarded for this so this is where we start to understand the decision making process that everything that we look at we look at in scope of these five rulings is it something obligatory something recommended something permissible something disliked or something impermissible all together and then the second phase of this is looking and deciphering is this something harmful to my akhirah is this something beneficial to my akhirah and then you want to strive for as much that is beneficial to your akhirah and abstain from that or as much as possible from that which is harmful to your akhirah and then our concluding point in the introduction last week we said one of the objectives as well is for the individual to understand the greater of the two benefits and the greater of the two harms the greater of the two benefits to pursue them the greater of the two harms to abstain from them the greater of the two harms to abstain from them and i will repeat this last week in order to truly benefit from this and i i believe that you know all of us are here tonight because we want to be from the pious we want to be from the righteous this is not going to happen just by listening to the halaqa and then going home and going back to our daily lives the only way this actually takes place that this halaqa has an impact on you is if you're engaging with the material it's a three week class all together it's not a long commitment there was last week this week and next week all together in total time of commitment you're looking at a maximum of 6 hours and that's if we're being extremely generous and that inshallah can change your life all together if you learn how to engage with this material so that means is keeping up with the discussion as we're having it going home and looking over your notes and also reading in advance for next week so that you know what is happening in class so that you know what we are discussing and as i mentioned last week as well we'll be doing this in a traditional manner where we have someone reading the text and then bi ibnahi ta'ala i will be explaining so inshallah munib will be our reader for the class tonight okay inshallah tayyib sorry no no the the muqtada microphone is working the camera microphone. Thank 
قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول واهل النعمان بيت بيت الى ابنائي ان الحلال بيت والحرام بيت وبينهما مشتبهات لا يعلمهن كثير من الناس فمن اتقى الشبهات فقد استبرأ لدينه وعرضه ومن وقع في الشبهات وقع في الحرام كالراعي يرعى حول الحمى يوصيه ان يقع فيه الا وان لكل ملك حمى الا وان حمى الله محارم محارمه الا وان في الجسد نطفه اذا صلحت صلح الجسد كله واذا فسدت فسد الجسد كله الا وهي القلب متفق عليه ان عمر بن بشير رضي الله عنه narrated i heard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala عليه وسلم Nauman in the brackets, Nauman pointed with his two fingers to his ear. Both lawful and unlawful are evident, and in between them are doubts and sins. So most people have no knowledge about them. So he who saves himself from his doubts and his sins saves his religion and his honor. And he who indulges in these doubts and sins is like a shepherd who pastures near the Himma, private pasture of someone else, and at any moment he is liable to get in it. So people beware, everything as a hima, and the hima of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth is what was declared unlawful. Beware in the body there is a piece of flesh, if it becomes sound and healthy, the whole body becomes sound and healthy. But if, you, if, but if it gets spoiled, the whole body gets spoiled, and that is the heart. Read upon. Okay. So when you're reading a text to a teacher or to a sheikh, you always begin by saying, Alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, or something of that nature, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salat and salam upon the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second thing that you do is to make dua for the author and everyone in the gathering as well. So you will say something like, Rahimanallahu wa iya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon us and him as well. And then you begin with the recitation of the text. And then you begin with the recitation of the text. So you always begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending salam and salam upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, making dua for the author and everyone in the gathering, and then you proceed to read the text. Then you proceed to read the text. Usually what happens is the reader will read a portion of the text, and the teacher says stop, and then the teacher explains up until that point. But for the sake of brevity for our class, we will be reading, inshallah, through the text all together, and then I will explain the text all together, bi ta'ala. So this hadith is narrated by al nuaman ibn Bashir. al nuaman ibn Bashir. al nuaman ibn Bashir was a very unique sahabi in the sense that he was a very young companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now why is this something that is very, very important? As a general rule and as a general concept, when you're doing explanation of a hadith, you want to assume the best of the person that has compiled that hadith. So in this situation, it's al hafid ibn Hajar. So what we're looking at is why would al hafid ibn Hajar rahimahullah begin with this hadith in particular? He could have chosen any of the hadith that are out there that talk about asceticism and talk about piety. Yet he started with this one for a specific reason. So part of our husn al part of our assuming the best of our you know, teacher in this situation, al hafid ibn Hajar rahimahullah, is that we assume that he did this for a very noble reason. And that noble reason in this situation is that Al-Hafid ibn Hajar is implying that this concept of piety and asceticism, developing zuhd and wara, it happens from a very young age. It is a lifelong long process that will take place, and it is not something that happens instantaneously. The clearest example of this is when you look at Salah. The Prophet he tells us to start teaching our kids to pray at the age of seven, and start enforcing it by the age of ten. Why is there this introduction? So that they can get used to it. It is something habitual. And then salah is something that you continue to work on your whole entire lives. It is only as you start experiencing salah as you get older at a much deeper level that you actually embrace the salah and want to continue to pray. But if you are not given that opportunity, you cannot enjoy the spiritual deepness of salah right away. People are like, hey, I just started praying. Why am I not able to be consistent? Because you're not supposed to be consistent right away. This is something that will take a long time. And you have to spiritually engage and tame your nafs and tame your desires and tame your soul to want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Al-Hafid ibn Hajar is indirectly teaching us that this concept of asceticism and piety 
It is a lifelong process that begins with a very young age. That begins with a very young age. Now this narration being by a Nu'mad ibn Bashir radiallahu anhu by saying, I heard it with my own ears, and he points with his own ears. Why is this something that he would do? Because as a young companion, there is a misunderstanding sometimes that perhaps the younger companions heard a hadith from older companions and would thus narrate the hadith while skipping the name of the older companions. Because you would think a young child, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, how much could he have retained from the Prophet ﷺ himself? So Nu'man ibn Bashir, pointing that he heard from his own two ears, is saying, I heard directly from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number three over here, we see this particular and special care that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shows to young children, particularly those that are talented and gifted. You can imagine there are tons of you know, Sahabis and Sahabiyat in the city of Medina. Many of them are young, but there are a few of them that you see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pays very, very special attention to. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lets them ride on his camel with him. And he pays special attention to give them advice. So you have a Nu'man ibn Bashir, you have Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, and some of the other Sahabis. All of these young companions, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam invested in. And this shows us this concept of investment in your own local youth is so important. That there are going to be talented and gifted youth in your community. You have to invest in them from a young age to make sure they are the future leaders. To make sure they are the future leaders. And this is what we're seeing from the Prophet Sallallahu in this hadith. In this hadith. Then the Prophet Sallallahu goes on to say, indeed that which is halal is clear and that which is haram is clear. What exactly does this term mean? Clear to whom and what exactly is clear about it? We as Muslims believe that anything that is beneficial to our akhirah, Allah's Messenger وسلم, has told us about it. And anything that is harmful and detrimental to our akhirah, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, has told us about it. And we see this in various narrations from the from the companions of the Prophet themselves, that there's not a bird that flaps its wings, except that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, gave us some knowledge about it. Meaning that the Prophet وسلم, has commented on everything that would we that we would need to know. And this is what made the Prophet وسلم, so confident that towards the end of his life, he gives us this narration that is narrated in the Sunnah of Ibn Majah, where he said, قَدْ تَرَقْتُكُمْ عَلَى الْبَيْضَاءِ that I have left you upon this clear white plain. That clear white plain is Islam. Its night is clear from its day. Meaning that the halal is clear from its haram. There is no like murky water in between. The halal is clear and the haram is clear. And no one deviates from this straight white path known as Islam except that this person is destroyed. Except that this person is destroyed. Destroyed in what way? Spiritually. Emotionally, your akhirah, all of that will be destroyed. Because Islam came as a whole system to protect not only the akhirah, but the dunya as well. So now when the Prophet ﷺ says that the halal is clear, meaning that everything that is halal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made clear to us. Everything that is haram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made clear to us. Now here is where we establish a fundamental principle. Anything related to the dunya, is permissible until proven otherwise. Anything related to the dunya is permissible until proven otherwise. So someone brings you a drink and says, what is the ruling on this drink? The default question you're asking is that this is halal until proven haram. So you have to find something in the drink that will make it haram. This applies to food, this applies to clothing, this applies to interaction with one another. Where does this not apply? Where does this not apply? In acts of worship. In acts of worship, everything is haram until proven to be halal. You're not allowed to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way that you desire. It has to be a way that is legislated from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It has to be a way that was legislated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has to be in a fashion that was done according to the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If we don't have anything directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that is when the opposite takes place. So 
that is what this clarity means. That anything that you need to know about your faith will be found in the Quran or will be found in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes on to mention that between these two matters, the Halal and the Haram, are those matters which are from the Mutashabihat, which are from the doubtful matters. When something is doubtful, what exactly does that mean? When something is doubtful, what exactly does that mean? When something is doubtful, it means that a person will proceed with caution. A person will proceed with caution. And what happens, if you look at the tradition of Islam, when something is doubtful, the scholars took one of two positions. Either they made tawakkul, which means we will stop, not give a ruling on this matter up until we find out more. Up until we find out more, and that is when we give a ruling on this matter. Or they decided to proceed with caution because a decision had to be made. And then they would assess their answer or assess their judgment based upon the experience and the outcome that would happen. Based upon the experience and the outcome that would happen. And both of these are permissible for the scholar to do. Both of these are permissible for the scholar to do. But what is a layman meant to do? There is something that is not clear to you. You don't know it's halal, you don't know it's haram. What is the layman meant to do in that situation? What do you guys think? Stay, for, stay away from it until what? Tells you something or until you go and ask them? Yeah. Until you go and ask them. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands in the Quran. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Then ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. So this is a fundamental guideline that we need to establish. Your faith, your knowledge of Islam is no one else's responsibility other than yours. If you are not making an effort to study Islam and to learn Islam, then at the end of the day, if you end up doing something wrong, there's no one to blame except yourself. Right? And this is why Islamic education needs to be taken so seriously. Because this is literally a matter of Jannah and Jahannam. It is literally a matter of paradise or the hellfire. And this is why it is incumbent that every Muslim takes it seriously. Now, what is a brief methodology that you would establish for studying Islam? A lot of this will depend upon what your objectives are. There are those of us that are content with just knowing that which is relevant to us. And that is perfectly fine. Not everyone is required to be a scholar. So what that means is everything you need to know at your level, you're required to have learned from someone knowledgeable. So the average Muslim needs to know how to pray. They need to know how to fast Ramadan. They need to know how to give their zakat. These are the general rulings of fiqh that every Muslim is required. Then there's a second tier which will become incumbent upon you based upon your profession. So if someone is a doctor, someone is an engineer, someone is doing business, then there are components of that business or that uh, profession where you need to seek knowledge about as well. So as a doctor, you know, you need to prescribe a medicine that has alcohol in it. What is the ruling on that? Then these are things that you need to study. Or perhaps you're a businessman that sells stuff and you want to sell something on installments. Are you allowed to do that? So all of these questions you need to have studied in advance so that if you were to partake in them or to abstain from them, you're doing based upon knowledge. The second tier are those that want to become students of knowledge. Those that have the ambition to learn more. For those particular people, we suggest that they study a particular madhab. So you choose a particular madhab from the four madhab, the Hanafi madhab, the Shafi madhab, the Maliki madhab, the Hanbali madhab, and you find a primer, an introduction to those madhahib, and that is what you study. And that is what you study. So in the Hanafi madhab, we study something like Muqtasar Quduri. In the Maliki madhab, we might study al Risala. Shafi madhab, we might study um, the Muqaddim of Ibn Abi Zayd. In the Hanbali madhab, we study something like Umdat al Fiqh by Ibn Qudama. You take that text, you find someone to teach you. You find someone to teach you. And that will give you a basic guideline in every single chapter of Islam, you will have at least one opinion on what you're allowed to do. And that will be one opinion based upon that madhab, and that is what you're allowed to pursue. 
And then you have the third tier, those that are pursuing the path of scholarship. Those that are pursuing the path of scholarship. And they will get involved in the evidences for those matters and the legal reasonings for those matters in Usul al fiqh and then they will pursue that path even further. Now what you see is incumbent in all three of these stages is someone to help you along the process. For the first phase, which is the layman, they're just required to have a mufti. They just need a mufti, they don't need a teacher per se. Whereas the second and third tiers, they will need teachers and mentors to help them along the way. Because the concept of student and knowledge and you know a, a scholar, there, there's no fine line in between them. They overlap. Because you may be a scholar in certain things of Islam, but you're still studying other things in Islam. And you're constantly going, constantly learning. And that is how you learn about the halal and the haram. And you learn about those doubtful matters. Now where will a lot of the doubtful matters take place? In things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed about in the Quran and the Sunnah? Or things that are modern day concepts? What do you think about that? Where will the majority of doubtful matters take place? In the wazil, which are modern day concepts, or in things that have already been revealed? Modern day concepts. And that is the reality. The vast majority of doubtful matters will be in modern day concepts. Does that mean that mutashabihat cannot take place in things that have already been revealed? No, that's not true. If you look at the issue of should a person go down into sajda on their hands first or their knees first, this is from the doubtful matters. That you see that there is no clear cut evidence based answer or for this. Where you can say that this group of scholars is completely right, that group of scholars is completely wrong. Right? There is that gray area. And then the scholar makes his ishtihad at that time. So the vast majority of doubtful matters will be in nawazil and modern day issues, but they can take place in traditional issues that have been discussed as well. So now getting back to the layman, this issue of something doubtful arises, your general methodology is going to be, I will not partake in this up until I find out an answer. I will not partake in this up and until I get an answer. Now, let us approach this from a scholarly perspective. Why would something be doubtful to a scholar? Why would something be doubtful to a scholar? And we'll discuss three main reasons. We'll discuss three main reasons. Reason number one is that the scholar finds opposing proofs. The scholar finds opposing proofs. So in that situation, he is not sure in terms of what the correct opinion is. And this is something that will become doubtful for him. So this opposition of proofs can be something that is general versus something specific. Or it can be something abrogated and an abrogator. Or it can even be something linguistic. That this word has so many linguistic meanings that they are, he's unable or she is unable to decipher which linguistic meaning applies over here. Is there a particular sharia meaning that applies? Is there a custom meaning that applies? Or is there just a linguistic meaning that applies? These are all reasons why this can be something that they would find contradictory opinions on. Number two is how the scholars will apply usul al-fiqh. How the scholars will apply usul al-fiqh. And you will see that each madhab has its own principles that it will apply in terms of deriving a ruling. So for example, if you look at the Hanbali Madhab, in the Hanbali Madhab, if you're commanded to do something, it means you have to do it right away. In the Shafi Madhab, if you're commanded to do something, it means you have flexibility in doing it up and until there's a proof to prove that you have to do it right away or within a specific period of time. And this is where the famous difference of opinion takes place when the commandment for Hajj came down. Are Muslims required to perform Hajj right away as soon as they're physically and financially able to do so? Or is there flexibility that when I get older, I can perform Hajj at that time, even though I already have the means financially and physically to do so? So you find that the Ambali Madhab says, no, you have to do it right away, based upon the understanding that Al-Amar Yaqtadi al that the commandment necessitates that you do it right away. Whereas in the Shafi Madhab, there is that flexibility that because there is no clear timeline on what this has to be done by, you are allowed to delay that action. You are allowed to delay that action. 
So the way they apply the usul al-fiqh would also make a huge difference in this. A third reason why this may be from doubtful matters for a particular scholar is because back in the day, they didn't have search engines. They didn't have huge compilations like we have today. They would have to go back to their own manuscripts and the manuscripts of whatever colleagues they know of and go through those manuscripts to get a ruling or to get an understanding. And that is why in certain localities, in certain areas of the world, a hadith did not reach. A hadith just did not reach those areas. And that is why for certain scholars, it became a doubtful matter because they're unable to find anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought forth. Now, this is where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he goes on to mention the crux of what we are talking about. And the crux of what we are talking about is when you abstain from those doubtful matters, you um, release yourself from, from criticism. Or, so you free yourself from criticism. You free yourself from criticism. Now, this is where the concept of the safer approach applies. And this is in all matters that you want to apply in your life. That this journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will have almost like a political spectrum. Those that will take a very conservative, precautious approach to their lives, only doing things very, very cautiously and those that will take a more progressive such liberal approach that hey, you know, who cares about the after effects? It's halal, let me just pursue it anyways. And this is where we realize that not everything that is halal necessarily should be pursued. Do we understand what that concept means? Not everything that is halal should automatically be pursued. There should be a reason behind why you're doing that particular activity. So everything that you do should have a reasoning behind it. Everything that you do should have a reasoning behind it. So for example, eating is halal. But at a certain point, is there a time that you should stop? Yes. Same thing with the sleeping. Same thing with how much you have to drink in terms of water and other things as well. In terms of, you know, games that you play in terms of physical activity. Everything should have its boundary. And you do want to develop that frame of mind that I'm going to do it to a certain degree because it is beneficial to my akhirah or to my dunya or to a family member or to someone else. So there has to be some sort of benefit in it or an abstaining from harm, or an abstaining from harm. Now the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he informs us over here that if you fall into doubtful matters, then that is your fault if people criticize you for it. It is not the people's fault for criticizing you, it is your fault because you're not making an effort to abstain from it. And this is someone that continuously falls into those doubtful matters. Continuously falls into those doubtful matters. So, I'll give you an example that is very, very real. This issue of marijuana. You may think that it is clear cut that Muslims know that marijuana is haram. That is not the case at all. There are genuinely Muslims that actually believe marijuana is halal. They genuinely believe that. Why? Because it's not explicitly mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, and because it's not mentioned, therefore it may be halal. I'll give you a real example from uh, the Islamic school. Not this Monday, the Monday before. Dr. Nazir and myself did a presentation at the Islamic school for high school students. Did I share this story already? No, I didn't share the story. We did a presentation for high school students on marijuana, the rulings on it, the, the, the harm that it has. And at the beginning of our presentation, we said that the reason why we're having this presentation is because on Wednesday, marijuana is becoming legalized. The kids started clapping and cheering. That was the reality. Now, here's a scarier reality. We asked them, how many of you know someone that has taken marijuana? 95% of the kids raised their hands. That is the reality of the, of the situation. Now, is this to put the Islamic school down? No, not at all. This is to point out that there is general unclarity on modern day issues. That because we come to the masjid, because we come to alafaz, we assume that everyone is on our level of knowledge. But that is not the case. There are other Muslims that, you know, they pray at home, they try to attend Jummah from time to time, usually at masjid where the Imam doesn't speak their language, 
so they don't benefit too much, and they want to get by just with the basics. So they don't get to know these modern day issues very, very well, which further trickles down to their children. Their children will not know about it as well. So here, what ends up happening is as they grow older, and perhaps let's just say they're smoking marijuana, it was something doubtful for them. They didn't take the safer approach. And the safer approach should have been learning about that matter, finding out about that ruling, and then pursuing an action based upon that ruling. But living this life or being comfortable the way you are and not learning, falling into doubtful matters, that is where people become criticized for the actions that they do. So now if they become criticized that their acceptance and testimony is not accepted in Islam, or they're not considered trustworthy uh, in, in terms of, of their character, they have no one to blame except themselves. That is what the Prophet Sallallahu is saying, that if you stay away from those doubtful matters, you have protected your honor, and you will remain dignified. But if you fall into those doubtful matters, then this is something that you will and can be criticized for, and the people will not be blameworthy for that. The people will not be blameworthy for that. Then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes on to say, and whoever falls into the doubtful matters will eventually fall into haram. Whoever falls into doubtful matters will eventually fall into haram. Who can explain this portion? What does this mean? That whoever falls into doubtful matters will eventually fall into haram. What does that mean? Yeah, go ahead. Lack of, uh, lack of trust, lack, lack of iman. Lack of trust, lack of iman. Who else? Excellent. So the gradual process that takes place, this is one explanation for it. That you get so comfortable in falling into doubtful matters and for discussion, falling into things that are makruh, right? Things that we deem that are not haram, right? That they're just doubtful matters or they're gray areas or things that we're not sinful for per se. That a person will continue to follow this trajectory of hey, it's only doubtful or hey, it's only makruh, it's not haram until they become so easygoing that their natural trajectory is to fall into something haram. Their natural trajectory is to fall into something haram. What is another way we can understand this? Yeah, go ahead. Not worshipping Allah. I appreciate the effort. What is another way? Yeah. Right. So they avoid the doubtful matters all together. All together. Correct. So now, how do we understand the reverse? That those people that do fall into haram through the doubtful matters, how does that take place? So one way we've learned is that they go from one doubtful matter to something that is more doubtful, to something that is more doubtful, to something that is eventually haram. That is one way of looking at it. That there's a gradual trajectory. What is another way of looking at? Excellent. That this person is so, uh, I guess, apathetic towards this concept of halal and haram and makruh and mustahab, that they will fall into haram and not even realize it. Right? Because they've developed this mindset that, you know, these are just terms that we've heard and they're not really relevant to our times and they're not important to us. And this person will fall into haram and not even realize it. So it's a, an attitude of apathy, whereas the second is an attitude of hey, it's only makruh, it's only doubtful, it's not haram, so I'm safe. So those are the two methods that most people will eventually fall into haram. So when the Prophet ﷺ says that the doubtful matters will eventually will lead to haram, that is how it takes place. That is how it takes place. Then the Messenger of Allah ﷺ goes on to say that every king has a sanctuary. Every king has a sanctuary. And the closer that you get to that sanctuary, you will eventually fall into the, the, the outer boundary of it. You will, you're outside the protection of that sanctuary. The sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are his mahal, are his mahal, meaning those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made him permissible. Now, how do we understand this concept? I want you to think of a circle. 
This circle is all of Islam. All of Islam is within this circle. And you are at its center point. You are at its center point. Any direction that you are going, the grade of your action is changing. So you're going from far to mustahab, to mubah, to makruh, till you reach that outer line, which is haram. Till you reach that outer line, which is haram. And that is what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, that consider yourself the center of attention. And you have this circle around you, that if you stay within this circle, you will have the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will protect you and will look after you and will take care of you. But as soon as you cross this boundary of haram, then that is when you're outside the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have transgressed against his laws and therefore you will no longer have the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like a king has his territory, as long as you're in that territory, that king will take care of you, his army will take care of you, all of that will take place. But you leave that territory, you're no longer under the king's protection. And that is what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, that as long as you stay within the boundaries of haram, you're under the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You step out, and therefore you become an enemy, an enemy territory, and can be confused for an enemy. You can be confused for an enemy. What this is, is, why this is relevant to us is how close are you willing to get to that boundary? You know, we always think there's a fence there. Let us see what's on the other side of the fence. The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And we'll take these small baby steps based upon our desire, based upon our lack of knowledge, till we get to the fence. And we're like, wow, there's a river there. Maybe if I can go to that river and grab something to drink and come back quickly, no one will notice and I'll be fine. You cross the fence, you try to get into the river, the current is too strong, and you end up drowning in that river and going far, far away from it. And that is the nature of sin. Where people think that, hey, we know that's haram. That you tell someone to commit zina, they're not going to commit zina. But you tell someone, you know what, we have to study together. We have to work together. Oh, it's late at night. You know, it, it shouldn't be a problem that we're alone together. Oh, I'm only communicating for work. I'm only communicating for school. Let us just text each other. Oh, modern day technology allows us to share emojis instead of using words. Those emojis can easily be misconstrued and misunderstood. And that is how the traps of shaitan start. And that is how the desires of the heart get wild up. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, before you even get to the fence, be cautious of which direction you're going in. Be cautious of that fence. Because once you get to that fence, the current is so strong, that magnetic pull is so strong, you will want to go to the other side. But if you stay far away from that fence, you're within the best protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where nothing can harm you, nothing can allure you, and you will be safe at that time. Then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes on to tell us, how does a person develop this? How does a person develop this? He says, Allah wa inna fil jasadi mudha. That indeed in the body is a morsel of flesh. Indeed in the body is a morsel of flesh. If it becomes rectified, all of your actions will become rectified. And if it is corrupt, all of it will be corrupt. Indeed, it is the heart. Now, this is where we start to understand the relationship between revelation and the state of the heart. And there's a lot that can be said about this. But if you take the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah, Allah, that be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah will teach you. This is not Allah teaching you to read and write. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifying your heart to such a degree that it becomes ultra sensitive to the haram. Ultra sensitive to the haram. That it doesn't even want to come close to it. It doesn't want to even smell it or see it or touch it or hear about it. And that is for the mind and the heart that develops the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are telling us in this hadith that if you're able to purify your heart, there will be a natural guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you stay away from the haram. But if you pay no attention to your heart, no matter how much knowledge you attain, it becomes a further proof against you on the day of judgment. It becomes a further proof 
against you on the day of judgment. And this is why our religion cannot be separated from spirituality. Our religion is not just hadith and tafsir and fiqh. Our religion is spirituality. What does spirituality actually mean? Spirituality means getting your heart in such a state that when you hear a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your heart desires to do it as quickly as possible. You hear a prohibition from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to stay as far away as possible from it. What affects the heart? Many, many things. But what I will share for our discussion today, the greatest key to protecting the state of your heart is making mulazama of istighfar. The greatest key to protecting the sanctity and the purity of your heart is continuously seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Asking for forgiveness for the sin that you have committed knowingly and unknowingly. Asking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the makruh that you have fallen into. Asking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the mustahabbat, the recommended things that you did not do. And if you can establish this in your day-to-day -day life, just making istighfar continuously for the haram that you fell into, for the makruh that you fell into, for the mustahab that you did not do, this will take you a long, long way in being in that sanctuary and that protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second phase of this is increasing yourself in knowledge. Understanding the rulings of everything that you do and then making sure that you yourself are staying within the farm and in the mustahabbat. Do not let yourself even go to the mubah. That even when you eat, you're doing it as an act of worship. You say bismillah before you eat. You have the intention, I want to eat to get stronger to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm sleeping so that I can gain strength and energy to worship Allah. I'm drinking because it is the right of my body and it will give me more energy to worship Allah. I'm interacting with people because I know this is what my mind needs. That I disconnect a little bit now so that I can engage in more worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later. Everything becomes intentional and that can only happen by knowledge. And then the benefit of knowledge is you learn about those deeds and those actions that will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the rest of humanity does not know about. So when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches us Sayyidul Istighfar, the dua which is like considered the, the master of all duas and seeking forgiveness of Allah. Whoever says it during the day and dies at night is entered into paradise. Whoever says it at night and dies during the day is entered into paradise. Most people don't know this dua. But through your knowledge, you learn this, you start implementing it, and you start getting this reward. You hear about the hadith of the Prophet wasalam, that whoever prays his 10 or 12 sunnah prayers is promised a house in paradise. You start increasing in your actions, and therefore, the more you increase in your actions, the more difficult it becomes to commit sins. But in the hereafter, consider all the houses that you will have in paradise. Right? So these are the things and the benefits of knowledge. And that is why it is so important that Muslims continue to seek that knowledge for the sake of purifying their hearts. And then for the sake of also finding out what is haram, so you stay as far away as possible. So you stay as far away as possible. Inshallah, we will move on to the next hadith if there are no questions on the first one. Actually, sorry, there's one last thing I want to mention. And this hadith concludes by saying, Mutafaqun alayh, that it is agreed upon. This term mutafaqun alayh, it refers to that this hadith is reported by both Bukhari and Muslim. It is reported by Bukhari and Muslim. al hafid ibn Hajar rahimahullah, at the beginning of Bulug al-Maram, he goes on to explain what different terms will mean. So when it says mutafaqun alayh, means reported by Bukhari and Muslim. What is relevant to the believer here is that this is of the highest level of authenticity. Meaning that there is no doubt about its authenticity, because it is reported by Bukhari and Muslim. When al hafid ibn Hajar says, Rawahu as -sab ah, that the seven have narrated. What does that mean? This means Bukhari and Muslim, then Abu Dawood and at tirmidhi and Nasai and Ibn Majah, and what is the seventh one? Ahmad, Ahsan. And traditionally, before al hafid ibn Hajar, the seventh, was the Muwatta of Imam Malik. 
But from Bulugh al Maram onwards, when they said as Saba, it referred to the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. It referred to the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. When he says the people of the Sunan, it refers to the four Abu Dawood, Al Tirmidhi, Al Nasai, and Ibn Majah. When he says Rawahu al Thalatha, it refers to Ashab al Sunan, with the exception of Ibn Majah. With the exception of Ibn Majah. So these are the terminologies that Al Hafid ibn Hajar rahimahullah, uses throughout his book. The highest level of authenticity is when it says Mutafaqun Alayh. That is reported by both Bukhari and Muslim, so there's no doubt to its authenticity. And this is one of those hadith. Now we open up the floor for questions on our introduction and on this first hadith. Any questions? Right? Yeah. So are things like universally doubtful? Like yeah, the gray areas. Are they are they universal gray areas? Like for example, can can something be uh, a gray area to one person of one understanding and, and not a gray area for someone else. Yes, so gray areas, the brother's question is, are gray areas universal or are they subjective? And the answer to that, it is purely subjective based upon the person's knowledge. Particularly in this day and age, the more knowledge a person has and the more foresight they have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the less gray those areas become. And the only way that is developed is by knowledge and the top of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala staying away as far as possible from the gray areas so that you can recognize it. Because if you fall into the gray area, then all you see is good. Good question. Any questions from the sisters? Any questions from the sisters? Go ahead. Ask away. Back to the brothers. No question? No? Going once. Going twice. Pass it to one the next time. Our sister that was there. Go ahead. Why do we need to follow one book? So that is for the uh, student of knowledge as they want to develop their understanding of Islam. Then they have to have a manual. They have to have a curriculum. And that is what the schools of thoughts are for. They are a curriculum of understanding. So the layman does not require to follow a madhab, he is required to follow a mufti, whereas the student of knowledge, we encourage them to follow a madhab, and that is to, for, to, for the sake of facilitating having an opinion on every issue. Does that mean they're blindly bound to that madhab? Not necessarily, not necessarily. But for the sake of hacking, having a curriculum, they should be following a madhab of a curriculum in order to cover every single issue in Islam. Now, getting back to this hadith. The second hadith that Al-Hafid ibn Hajar brings in this chapter is from the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. So he said that the first narrator was a young companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second narrator is a companion that narrated the most amount of a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though he was from the later companions to accept Islam. He accepted Islam in Am al Khaybar, in the year of Khaybar, which was either the eighth, the seventh, or eighth year of the Hijrah. And in those three to four years, he was with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was able to narrate thousands of ahadith. And he narrates his story himself that you can find in Sahih al-Bukhari. He says, while the muhajirun were busy with their business and the ansar were busy with their farming, I made it my prerogative to accompany and follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anywhere he would allow them to. Basically, he would continue to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa up when he would tell the Prophet would say, Abu Huraira, you know, that's close enough, or that's far enough. And that is how close he would get to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So any opportunity he would have, he would follow the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is how he was able to narrate so much. Now what that also means is that he would have to sacrifice a lot. Because look at how he describes the Muhajirun and the Ansar. 
He is describing Muhajirun as busy in business. He is describing the Ansar being busy as farmers. And those are pretty much the, the only two things that you can do in Medina at that time. So what that meant was, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he has to sacrifice his profession, either doing business or either being a farmer, and was dependent upon whatever the Ummah would give him for a noble cause. And that was for the sake of preserving Islam. And that is why you see that the Prophet sallallahu saw this noble intention and made dua for Abu Hurairah. He made particular dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows him to retain and protect everything that he learns. And that is how Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrates so much. It's also befitting that Al-Aqt ibn Hajj rahimahullah chooses this hadith from Abu Hurairah because Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu implemented this in his lifetime. He implemented this in his lifetime. Meaning that he had sacrificed all wealth for the sake of studying and learning Islam. He lived a very, very humble life. This story is further exemplified in Sahih al-Bukhari when it talks about how one, not one day, but rather, regularly, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu used to have seizures. And people would think that he was possessed by a jinn. So people would be like, let's beat the jinn out of him. Literally, that's what used to happen. So they put their foot on him, and people would likely beat him to beat the jinn out of him because they thought that he was having seizures because of possession. But Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he says, my only crime was that I was hungry. If someone gave me food, the seizures would have stopped. You look at the way his clothing is described, and it's literally the same clothing that he's wearing all the time, up until it's no longer suitable to be worn. I mean, there's so many cuts and tears in it. If you look at the hadith that talk about the Prophet wasallam telling the woman folk to go down into sajda quickly and delay, to delay in getting up in sajda. That hadith was there for particularly for the likes of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu who were so poor that their garments did not cover them properly. So when they went down into sajda, they were not fully covered. Not because they didn't, they, they chose not to, it's because they couldn't afford it. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded the women folk, go down before the men in sajda and get up earlier before the men in sajda so that they are not exposed. They are not exposed. And that was also for the likes of Abu Huraira who lived such a poor life. Now this second hadith of Zuhd wal Wara is extremely relevant to our times because it directly addresses the disease of materialism. Directly addresses the disease of materialism. And you notice specifically the message of Allah وسلم, He says that destroyed is the one that worships the dinar, destroyed is the one that worships the dirham, and destroyed is the one that worships this luxurious clothing. What is the benefit behind the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioning these three things? At that time, currency was only of two types. You either had gold or you had silver. And generally from psychological study and understanding, when it comes to financial matters, men will have a natural aptitude an inclination towards financial matters that women will not have. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam includes a third category to say that even the women folk are not safe from materialism. And that is when he mentions this silk garment and this silk clothing. Now you will notice that having gold within of itself is permissible. Having silver within of itself is permissible. Having silk within of itself for women and as long as men are not wearing it is permissible. So these are all permissible matters. Yet the Prophet sallallahu is talking about those that worship these things. So what exactly does worship mean over here? Does that mean that they're performing sajda? Does that mean they're performing ruhuwa? No, that's not what it's talking about at all. It means that the primary focus or one of the primary focuses of their life becomes these material matters and these material gains. So you will want to get as far ahead in life as possible for the sake of accumulating this wealth. For men in accumulating as much gold and silver and money as possible. For women in terms of the material objects, whether it is dresses, whether it is garments, or anything of that nature. Shoes, purses in our day and age. Like if you look at some of the prices of these things, it's absolutely atrocious. Like $500, $1,000 for shoes and a purse. It's fine buying it as a one-off thing, as a special treat for yourself. But it's not about buying it as a one-off. It's about when you start worshipping it. 
how do we start worshiping it? That you are willing to attain these things by any means necessary. So if it means partaking in the riba, no problem. If it means cheating people out of their money, no problem. If it means by doing other halal things like going for a lottery, no problem. This is very interesting, subhanAllah. You know the recent lottery in the United States. Did you guys hear about that? $1.6 billion. That's insane. You can become a billionaire overnight. And then you had all of these famous celebrities that were going out and buying these lottery tickets. Some of them just for the sake of having fun and wanted to see if they win, win. But you had like genuine poor people, subhanAllah, that literally are living day to day, like, you know, hands to mouth. That's how they're living, subhanAllah. That are literally wanting to bank on the fact that, you know, let me spend all of my savings on this lottery because if I win, that is the jackpot. And this is what I'm referring to. That accumulating wealth by any means necessary. Now what we need to understand about wealth is that wealth is a means and a medium. It is not a goal. For the believer, the objective of wealth is to keep it in their hands without reaching the hearts. To keep it in the hands without reaching the hearts. And this means you understand how evil it can be if you get attached to it. If you get attached to it. So I've done this exercise before. Let's do it again. Is money a good thing or a bad thing? If you believe money is a good thing, raise your hands. Excellent. If you believe money is a bad thing, raise your hands. Okay. And then, if you believe that there's a third option, raise your hands. Okay, excellent. That's what we want to get. Our, our, our kids over here, what is the third option? You have your hand up. What is the third option in money? Yes. So would it make it good or bad though? Both? <laughs> you didn't get the detailed answer right, but the primary answer is correct. And it is both. And that is the answer to both. That is the answer to both. You want to share? Go ahead. It depends on how you use the money. And that's what we're looking for. That wealth is all about the state of your heart. And what you want to view wealth, wealth as is a magnifying glass. That if your heart is pure, wealth will magnify the purity. So you're spending in pure causes, you're earning from pure means. If your heart is corrupt, you will spend in corrupt means, and you will earn from corrupt means. So it magnifies the corruption if the heart is corrupt. And that is why this simplistic approach to wealth, that hey, all money is good and all money is bad, is, is, it's not befitting a believer to think like that. All of it will always stem down to the state of your heart. If your heart is pure, you earn from halal, you spend in halal. Your heart is corrupt, you earn from haram, you spend in haram. That is what it comes down to. And we see this understanding from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The famous hadith, Zahaba Ahlul Dhuhuri bin Ujur, that O Messenger of Allah, the rich companions amongst us have run away with all of the reward. They pray just like we pray, they fast just like we fast. They give in sadaqah, that which we cannot give. Teach us something, if we were to do it, we will be at par with them. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the version of Sahih Muslim, teaches them to say SubhanAllah 33 times, Alhamdulillah 33 times, and Allahu Akbar 33 times. Some time goes by, they come complaining again. O Messenger of Allah, these rich companions have caught up with us, they've learned our secret, teach us something more. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ وَتِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ That is the favor of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. He gives to whom He pleases. Meaning that if you are a pious and righteous believer, that spends in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the best case scenario. That is the best case scenario. Now this is where we establish the fundamental rule of Islamic economics and Islamic finance. Your iman always has to be greater than your finances. Your iman always has to be greater than your finances. Meaning that you're not willing to compromise on where you earn your money from, and you're not willing to compromise what you spend your money on. There are certain ways that a Muslim will not earn money from. So if it means working for a bank, they will not do it. If it means working for an insurance company, they will not do it. If it means working for a lottery company, they will not do it. If it means working for an alcohol company, they will not do it. And likewise, when it comes to spending money, when it comes to any of those things that are impermissible, dealing with interest, 
and purchasing alcohol, purchasing drugs, marijuana, pork, any of those things, the believer will not spend their money on those things because they believe them to be evil and every evil will affect the heart. Every evil will affect the heart. So this is what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is addressing in this hadith. It's not about physically bowing down and making sajda and ruku. It's about your ethics and your values. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, says that whoever compromises their ethics and their values to accumulate wealth by any means necessary will be destroyed. Will be destroyed. And then the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he goes on to give these people a characteristic. These people, if you give them, they are happy. But if you withhold from them, then they become upset and sad. Now part of that is human nature. Part of that is human nature. You're given something, you will be happy. You are held back from something, you will be upset. But this is to the degree where they become discontent with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they say, why did so and so get such and such, but I did not get such and such. So they become unpleased with the qadr of Allah and they criticize the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either in their emotions or in their words. And this is what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is referring to. Who remembers the statement of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah last week where he was talking about an individual that had a million dollars. And that's our translation. What did Imam Ahmad say about the person that has a million dollars? Can they be a zahid or not? Based upon what condition? Who remembers? Excellent. And that is what Imam Ahmad was referring to in direct relationship to this hadith. That if he's increased in his wealth, he doesn't become happier. If he's decreased in his wealth, he doesn't become sad. Now the point is, how do we reach that level? And what does that level actually look like? That level means that you're not attached to what is being given or taken away. You're attached to the one that is giving it or holding it back. That is what this looks like. You care more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving or taking away from you. You have such a high level of reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you understand that having more does not necessarily mean benefit and having less does not necessarily mean suffering. And the clearest example of this, I believe I mentioned this in the khutbah two or three weeks ago, is in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. Every time Yusuf alayhi salam got more, he was tested more. He was tested by his brothers. Why? Because his father loved him more. That extra love from his father caused him, caused him to be tested by his brothers. He gets older, handsome looking guy, that becomes a test for him because he's more good looking than the other men around him. And therefore he is seduced and is attempted to be seduced. And therefore when he refuses, he's thrown into jail. Those extra good looks got him into problems. And this is the perception you need to come with and understand that having more is not necessarily better and having less is not necessarily worse. There is a spiritual foresight that is required. And that spiritual foresight is in understanding that tests can come in good and in, in be given and tests can also be come in from refraining. Most of us will do a great job in refraining. So someone passes away, someone dies, we're patient, we're easygoing, we don't, you know, lose control of our, of, our, of, our, of our state. But when we have so much and we're living very uh, gluttonous lives, what happens to us then? We forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't pray those extra sunnah prayers. Now what is that, the baseline that we're trying to compare to? When things are difficult, you're going through a divorce, you lose your job, you fail an exam, something catastrophic is happening in your life, look at the state of your dua, look at the state of your salah. Look at how drastically it increases. That is the baseline you want to establish. That when you are in a state of luxury, in a state of prosperity, how do you reach that level of desperation, that level of heightened emotion in your salah, in your dua, in your recitation of the Quran? In times of adversity, it is through patience. In times of prosperity, it is through gratitude, recognizing who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reminding us of over here, do not get attached to the gift, get attached to the giver.
Because whether gift comes or goes, it's irrelevant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always be there to take care of you. And I always remember this one statement of my teacher when he's talking about the animal kingdom. That before human interference, did you ever hear of an animal dying of hunger? Like, think about this question. Before human interference, did you ever hear of an animal dying of hunger? You didn't. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created enough risk for every single animal. There are enough worms on this earth for every single bird. There are enough fish on this earth for every single animal that eats fish or bears, let's just say. Right? There is enough of everything for everyone. Allah has decreed and written that sustenance. And it is only human greed that destroys these natural ecosystems. So that is what you have to understand. That Allah will provide for you just like he provides for the bird that leaves its nest early in the morning with its stomach empty and comes back at night with its stomach full. That it does its due diligence by going out and looking for worms, but it also knows that Allah Razak has created enough worms that even if all of the birds had their worms, there's still a worm left for me and for my family to share, and that is enough to survive. And that is the essence of the second part of this hadith. We will start the third hadith, inshallah, and then we'll continue that uh, next week. And we'll take questions on the second hadith uh, after the after this. So this hadith is narrated by Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu, the son of Abdullah bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. And as we mentioned, he was one of the younger companions as well. So here you see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is again emphasizing and using this hadith of a young man to draw attention, right? He grabs him by the shoulder. He grabs him by the shoulder. And he tells this young man, be in this world as if you are a stranger or a wayfarer. Now I want you to think of what impact this has on a young man's life. That someone like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam grabs this young child and gives him this piece of advice. Be a stranger or a wayfarer. What exactly do these terms mean? What exactly do these terms mean? The stranger is the individual that takes basically what he needs from the place that he is going to, nothing more and nothing less. And this person will feel a sense of estrangement. They will feel a sense of estrangement in their surroundings because they are not familiar. Because of that, when it comes to the matters of the dunya, they don't know anything about it. Why? Because they were created primarily for the akhirah, and they understand that is their primary destination. That is their primary destination. So they live amongst the people, not with the people. Amongst the people meaning that the people are all around them, but they're not like them. Their primary focus is the akhirah. The focus of the people is in the dunya. The Abir al-Sabil is the wayfarer that he actually goes into the town and he stays amongst the people and he takes from that town just what he needs to survive. So the Gharib, he didn't take anything. He's there amongst them, but he's not taking anything. Whereas the Abir al-Sabil, he will get a simple bed, a simple couch, a simple house, takes the simplest of everything. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, be like the first or be like the latter. The first that it takes nothing, and is content just moving along and understanding that the akhira will be his. Whereas the second person, they will get a little bit of the dunya, but at its simplest level. Just enough to find some comfort and then move on to the greater destination. And then move on to the greater destination. 
And this is where it is so important to understand the beauty in simplicity. One of the biggest mistakes that we make in parenting is giving our children everything. That is one of the biggest mistakes in parenting. We want to make sure that our children feel comfortable sleeping on the floor. We want to make sure that our children feel comfortable just having a simple, you know, sheet on the ground, have a pillow, be comfortable with that. As you get older, introduce them to further luxuries. As a young child, give them basic foods that is healthy and nutritious, but you don't have to give them seven different types of ice cream, four different types of chocolates, and X, Y, and Z. Give them with simple foods. Why is it so important at a young age? If you spoil them at a young age, they get accustomed to luxury and detaching from the dunya becomes so much more difficult. Whereas if you are raised in a household that is detached from the dunya, giving up the dunya does not become difficult as you grow older. And as you grow older and experience luxury, because you come from a simple upbringing, even though you may have money, you actually become appreciative for what you have. Nowadays, you see ungrateful little brats, and I you know, hate using that term, but it's a reality that we've spoiled our kids so much that they're not grateful for anything, right? You give them uh, a Nintendo Switch, they're like, I want an Xbox One. You give them, you know, a pen and paper, and they're like, I want a cell phone. Like, they're not happy with, with simple basic things anymore because we've ruined them. And this hadith is an indication of how young people should be brought up, and this is why the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is instilling it in this person. Now this is an attitude that needs to be developed that we don't need to have the best of everything. We don't have, need to have the latest version of everything. We do not need to compete with other people. Our only competition is getting to the Akira. Our only competition is getting to the Akira. Then Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu, as he narrates this hadith, he gives his own explanation. He gives his own explanation and that is what we will comment on next week in the Allah Ta'ala. That is what we will comment on next week in the Allah Ta'ala. So let me share a fortunate and unfortunate news with you. The fortunate news is, Alhamdulillah, we have a pretty good pace going in the class, but it is not a pace that is quick enough to finish the text. So what we can do is, we can try to cut down the explanation and finish all of the ahadith, or we can take it as detailed as we're taking it, but then we won't finish all the hadith, all 11 of them. I'll leave the decision up to you guys. So by a show of hands, how many of you would like to continue at the pace that we're going? It's a detailed explanation, but we will not cover all of the hadith. Or how many of you prefer that we quick speed up the pace, go through it more quickly, so that we can complete all 11 of the hadith? So how many of you want way number one, a more detailed explanation? Okay, and how many of you want way number two quick enough so that we can finish finish all the text? So way number one um, is the majority, and that's what we will be doing in the night ta'ala. So we'll continue with our pace, trying to take as much benefit from each hadith as we can. Also, we're we'll trying to do as many of the hadith that we can, and perhaps we will find another opportunity outside of the Friday halakas to finish this, inshallah, so that we don't uh, intervene with uh, the next imam schedule for the halakas. Wallahu ta'ala ala. I will leave the rest of the questions, uh, the rest of the time to make answer questions, or if you have to go make wudu, you can go and make wudu. Salah will be at 8.30 in the night. So questions from the brothers and sisters are welcome right now. Yes. And those of you that are not ans asking questions, please remain quiet and respect other people. Go ahead. Sisters, our sisters in the back, a brother is asking a question which I will repeat, but we do request that our brothers and sisters please respect the questioner, inshallah. Excellent. So, our brother's question goes back to hadith number one and the concept of protecting your public image. To what degree is a person required to protect their public image? From the actions of the Prophet sallallahu we see that the Prophet sallallahu was proactive in protecting his image. And we see this in the hadith of his wife Safiya, when one day he is walking outside late at night, 
and two of his companions saw him with a woman, perhaps whom they did not recognize. The Prophet ﷺ went out of his way to explain that this is my wife Safiya, and I didn't want anything to fall into your heart to think that I was doing anything wrong. And they said, Hasha Ya Rasulullah, that O Messenger of Allah, we would never think that way of you. So this means the Prophet ﷺ went out of his way to clarify his name. So by example, that means that any precautionary measures that you can take to protect your honor and to protect your reputation, you should be taken. If at that point, people still find reason to say something about you, that is their problem. But if you are not taking precautionary measures to protect your reputation and your honor and dignity, then this is something that needs to be assessed. Why is this the case? Right? One of the objectives of Sharia, of Islamic law, is hifzul al is the protection of reputation and honor. So all of the actions that Islam comes with is to protect it. So this is something that has to be taken very, very seriously. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands. Go ahead. Excellent. So our brother's question is, a follow-up question, what do you do in a situation where a person is being slandered and lied against? That they've taken precautionary measures, they feel like they've done in, uh, as much as they can, but this person continues to slander them. Our Islamic tradition teaches us that any time this has truly happened, where a person has taken all the precautionary measures and they're still being slandered, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exonerates them. We see this in the story of Yusuf, we see this in the story of Aisha, we see this in the story of Juraj. All three of them were falsely accused, and all three of them were exonerated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Maryam, you know, I forgot to mention Maryam as well. All four of them were uh, slandered, and all four of them were exonerated. So people that are tested in such a manner, they should keep their faith firm, keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help and for ease, and eventually they will be exonerated. Allah ta'ala. Any questions from the sisters? Going once, going twice, and I'll take one last question from the brother here. Go ahead. Uh, this is something like a fable, but money is never to be fable, or basically a certain level of discipline to make sure you're not there. And for war, basically all you do is spend your money. So, is that from up here? Our young brother was making a statement that money is not everything. If you're rich, you want more, and if you're poor, everything you need is right in front of you. We will conclude with that. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Next week's class again is going to be at 7 o'clock, inshallah. For those of you that want to benefit, bring the text with you. Revise your notes from this week so that you understand what's going on. It is a cumulative class. What you learned last week and this week is built upon next week as well. So, Jazakumma khair for your attention. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.